I'll tell you a little bit about this next piece. He was uh, quite a remarkable composer. And in 1942, he was living in Prague. And by that time, his politics had gone very far left. He had essentially become a communist. And also, he was Jewish. And so the Nazis arrested him in Prague, and they transported him to a concentration camp in Wolfsburg, Germany, where he perished later that year. So he had a very tragic end to his life. But his life began with tremendous promise. And just like Mozart, he was a, an astonishing child prodigy to the point where, when he was eight years old, he was taken to perform for the greatest Czechoslovakian musician of the day, and that, of course, was Antonin Dvorak. And when Dvorak heard him play, he said, well, this boy is a genius. He should be sent off to study at the Prague Conservatory. And by the time he was 10 years old, he was studying at the Prague Conservatory. And he progressed very quickly. And in the early years of the 20th century, he was a very precocious child, but he also had this adventurous and even a radical streak. Um, he was looking into all of the cutting edge music of the early 20th century by that time. And so some of his music sounds like the luminous, mysterious music of, of Claude Debussy, with whom he studied for a while in uh, Paris when he was a young man. Some of it sounds like the more rigorous and sophisticated and contrapuntal music of Max Reger, with whom he studied in Germany for a while. He was a good friend of Alban Berg. And so this expressionist, atonal side is also reflected in some of his music. And he admired his countryman, Leos Janacek, and this sort of folkloric modernist style. And he liked the music of Strauss. And he had this astonishing, almost chameleon-like ability to write in the style of whomever he was emulating. And I've, as a flutist, I've played some of his music. He wrote a flute sonata. And it varies from moment to moment. Sometimes it sounds like one composer and sometimes like another. So it's not always so easy to identify Schulhoff's music. But as I say, he was a spectacularly talented composer. And in 1914, when World War I broke out, he was drafted into the Austro-Hungarian army sent off to fight at the front. And he saw all of the worst things that you can see. And it was a horrific experience for him. And he was wounded. And this experience of World War I further radicalized him, both politically, he became a communist, and also uh, musically. And so he moved to Berlin after the war. And post-war Berlin was an extremely uh, radical place, both politically and also musically. And one of the attractions of being in Berlin is that in post-war Europe in general, Paris and Berlin in particular, American jazz musicians found a lot of audience there. And he grew to like jazz very much. And being a musical chameleon, he learned to play jazz. So he played good jazz piano, apparently. And one of the musicians that he met who was coming through Berlin was a jazz saxophone player named Billy Barton. And in 1929, Billy Barton in Berlin, he recorded a piece. I'll just play you a little bit so you hear what the music of the day sounded like. So this was the sound that he had in his ear when the following year, in 1930, Berlin Radio called him up and said, why don't you write a piece, we'll commission it from you, to play on the radio with Billy Barton. And so he wrote this piece we're about to hear called the Hot Sonata. This word hot refers to jazz in the 1920s. And it's an interesting piece. And like so much of his music, it's an interesting amalgamation of different styles as you see, it has four contrasting movements, like a Brahms violin sonata. 
but because he's writing it for a jazz saxophone player, it really is written in the harmonic and the rhythmic and the stylistic language of 1920s jazz. And I like the piece a lot, and I hope that you will enjoy hearing it too. So let's hear it now. <laughs> 